Hello out there. It's a pleasure to be in your room, in your ears, in your eyes, wherever you are. My name is Dickens Ziwa Senyonjo from the Scripture Union of Uganda Head Office. Today I'm privileged to bring you God's Word through a sharing on Psalm 23, a very common psalm that we all have gone through over and over again. It's a psalm of reflection that brings encouragement but also gives us confidence about the God that we serve. The psalm is very personal. There is no we or us or they, but only my and me and I and he and you. It is an overflow of David's personal experience with God. One of the reasons it has such an attraction for us is that we all hunger for such authentic experience with God. And a personal witness to that experience brings us a step closer ourselves. So in the spirit of the psalm, I thought I would just meander through the psalm with you and point out a few things that have proved of great significance to me personally in many ways. First of all, I have learned something from the form of the psalm. In the first three verses, David refers to God as he, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores my soul. Then in verse 4 and 5, David refers to God as you. I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. Then in verse 6, he switches back to the third person. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. The lesson I have learned from this form is that it is good not to talk very long about God without talking to God. Every Christian is at least an amateur theologian, that is, a person who tries to understand the character and ways of God and then put that into words. If we aren't little theologians, then we won't ever say anything to each other about God and will be of very little real help to each other's faith. But what I have learned from David in Psalm 23 and other Psalms is that I should interweave my theology with prayer. I should frequently interrupt my talking about God by talking to God. Not far behind the theological sentence, God is generous, should come the prayerful sentence, thank you God. On the hills of God is glorious, should come, I adore your glory. What I have come to see is that this is the way it must be if we are feeling God's reality in our hearts as well as describing it with our heads. So even the form of Psalm 23 seems designed to give us a heartfelt experience of God by causing us to mingle theology and prayer as we read it. The valleys draw us closer. But that is not all I have learned from the form. I asked myself, why does David switch from he to you precisely at verse 4? Why didn't he just go on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with me, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. I think the switch to the more intimate you precisely when he enters the valley of the shadow of death is a universal experience among God's people. Indeed, among all men in one form or another, the crises of life draw us closer to God. We are more prone to talk about God when we are in the green pasture and more prone to cry out to God when we enter some fearful ravine. And from this, we can learn that just as there is a danger in the valley that we might get angry at God and reject Him, there is an even greater danger in the green pasture that we might become satisfied with the green grass and forget the shepherd. In the dark, we hug his knee. In the light, we are prone to wander off in all directions. Therefore, as James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Everything that is good for us, that is what I have learned from pondering the form of Psalm 23. The next source of help came from the phrase, I shall not want. 
For a long time, I misunderstood the word want. In today's English, this sentence sounds like, I shall not desire. So I thought, David was saying that when God is your shepherd, you don't have the feeling of desiring anything anymore. But then along came Hebrew, and I discovered that the translators did not mean that. Rather, they meant want in the sense of be wanting. I shall not be wanting anything. The literal, less ambiguous translation would be, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Well, that solved one problem. Because I knew I still had desires for food, for work, for my children, for God. But it created another one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. What? Do God's people ever lack anything? We don't have to go outside the sun to know they do. When the sheep is walking through the dark valley, it lacks light. And I presume it lacks the green pasture and the quiet waters. Shia common sense tells us that no matter how well things are going, you always lack something. Blessings must wait their turn. I think, therefore, that what David means is that God's sheep and that is not everybody, but only those who trust him, never lack anything that the shepherd thinks is good for them. This is confirmed for me when I ponder upon verse 4 about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. The picture here is of a situation with extreme danger that could take the ship's life if the shepherd were not there to protect and guide with his rod and staff. But why would a ship be going through such a place. Not because he's straight off in sin. That is not the point here. Because the shepherd is pictured as going with the sheep, not snatching him back to the pasture he left behind. No, the reason the sheep is going through the valley is because the shepherd is leading it. The connection between verse 3 and 4 confirm this. I think he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even when I walk through the valley, you are with me. The path through the valley is always one of the paths of righteousness in which God leads. But why would a shepherd lead a sheep into a valley filled with danger and death threats? Isn't the only possible answer to get some better place? So I learned from verse 4 that I might indeed have to lack many things in following the shepherd, but I will never lack anything that the shepherd thinks is good for me. As Psalm 84 verse 11 says, No good does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. Or as Paul says in Philippians 4 19, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. The next phrase that has been a great source of strength to me is the phrase, He restores my soul. This could mean either he returns my soul from erring in sin or he refreshes my soul when I am dry and lifeless. The same phrase occurs in Lamentations chapter 1, verse 16, which says, My eye, my eye, runs down with water because far from me is a comforter, one who restores my soul. The idea of comfort also occurs here in Psalm 23 verse 4. Your rod and your staff comfort me. So I think we should probably think of soul refreshment here instead of moral correction. Proverbs 18 verse 14 says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a broken spirit who can bear? If our hearts are strong in the Lord, if our soul is refreshed, we can endure the pain of the body. But if the spirit is broken, if our hearts are downcast, if our soul is flat like a deflated beach ball, what can you do? The very will is broken. The flags of our affection just hang there with no wind to unfurl them. Every believer has known these times. I sure have myself. I have tried to analyze what I need in those times. I think I can sum it up in three things. First, I need a sense of release from the anxious cares that have made me feel hopeless. Sometimes the demands on our mind and our time combined 
with aggravating hindrances to getting it all done are like tight straps around the soul that squeeze all life and curl out of it. I need to feel those straps broken and a great swelling of hope. Second, I need to see some beauty. Psalm 19, we have all felt the healing power of nature. The sight of some stupendous beauty restored the soul. Thirdly, I need to feel the reality of a great power outside myself flowing into me. God created us to be conductors of an infinitely powerful current of life flowing from his, himself, which is why ultimately the only satisfying restoration of soul comes from God. If we try to make nature into our God, it will disappoint. God is going to roll up the sky like a garment someday and let us see the real thing. Until then, we should always avail ourselves of the word of God along with nature. For Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The instruction of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Nothing, not even nature, can cut the suffocating bands of anxiety from our soul, except one thing, the promises of God. Neither Valium nor any other tranquilizer can compare to healing that God says, Be content with what you have, for I will never fail you nor forsake you. Hence, we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? As we read in Hebrews 13 verse 5 and 6. Don't turn to drugs for the restoration of your soul. Turn to God. Turn to his word of promises and his works of beauty. Well, that is the beginning of what I have learned from Psalm 23. First from its form, that we ought not to speak too long about God with our minds before we turn and speak to God from our heart. We must stir a lot of prayer into the stew of our theology. And also from the form, it is during the crises of life that we are drawn closer to God and turn our theological statements about God's mercy into urgent cries for his help. Secondly, from the words I have learned from the psalm that I shall not want, I have learned to trust God, not for every possible pleasure, but for everything that would be good for me. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Even the valleys of the shadow of death are only pathways to greener pastures. And finally, from the words, he restores my soul. I have learned to wait for God in my periods of depression and lifelessness and to look for hope and beauty and power in his creation, but mostly in his word. May the Lord bless you as you reflect upon that psalm.